Well, good morning. Good morning and welcome to our service on this Good Friday. Welcome also to those who are online who've joined us. Thank you for coming along as we reflect over this weekend on the gift of Jesus. Would you stand with me as I read something to share with you and then the band will lead us. We'll just go straight into that first song. God who created us suffers because of us. God who gave up his son for the cross suffers for us. God who dwells inside us through the Holy Spirit suffers with us. And in God's suffering we find hope. God, our suffering God, your story brings us salvation. Without you, the horrors of human suffering would be unbearable. Your story gives life meaning. Because of your suffering, a new world has broken into ours. Your pain releases us from prison. Your agony frees us to live in love, joy and peace in your eternal resurrection glory. Sacrifice we love. 
remind us afresh today of the commitment we have because of what you've done for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. In Baptist churches across Australia today, as we celebrate, we give thanks to Jesus, we do so in our service, and we will be taking up an offering. The offering that we take up today is nothing to do with Arlington Baptist Church. The offering we take up today is for an organisation called Crossover, which is Australian Baptist Ministries, and it's the evangelistic arm of the, of the Australian Baptist Ministry. And through that ministry of crossover, they reach out, they train people to equip them to share the gospel in the context that they find themselves. And so it's our opportunity to give to that fund. It's not a tax-deductible fund, but it is a fund that helps to spread the gospel. Now, some of you may have already given something online, as we had last week, which is on the screen with you there. Um, we are going to take up the offering. There will be offering bags going by. Um, so please use that. And during the offering, we're going to be singing, but we'll remain seated. So just before we collect the offering, let's just pray. Father, we want to thank you for the wonderful opportunity that you have to support Crossover, to support this ministry of reaching out to others, to share the gospel message. And Father, as we present these gifts now, and as we sing the words of the song that remind us again of your sacrifice, we pray that you would speak to our hearts about how we can share the gospel with those we know, those we love, so they might too come to know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our stewards will now wait on us for offering, and during this Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom. 
We come now to our Bible reading, and our Bible reading from Matthew 27, 1 to 10, and 27 to 31. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans how to have Jesus executed. So they bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priest picked up the coins and said, it is against the law to put this into the treasury since it is blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spat on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. We're about to move to a time of communion, a time where we have the opportunity to reflect and give thanks for what Jesus has done. I invite you to stand as the band comes and we sing It's Your Blood in preparation for communion. Is your blood? 
From the beginning, when humanity first sinned, intention to redeem us so we could have eternal life in his great kingdom. And what God began came to complete fulfillment at the cross when Jesus said three words, it is finished. Eternal life for all who believe in his name suddenly became a living reality. In Romans we hear, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus stated with simple words that at that moment our debt for sin was completely paid in full because he became sin for us. Eternal life in Jesus Christ is possible because he was able to say, it is finished. The moment we repent and confess our sins before God, Jesus says, it's finished. Your sins are forgiven. I've paid the debt. He willingly died on the cross for us. From Galatians 3, it says, Christ redeemed us from that self-defeating curse of by absorbing it completely into himself. But let's make it personal. Christ redeemed me, you, from our self-defeating cursed lives by absorbing it completely into himself. What a gift. It is because of the work of Jesus that we can join together today to share in this communion service. Would you join me as I pray? Our Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting, eternal love. But we've gone our own ways and we've rejected your will for our lives at times and we confess our sin, we confess our rebellion from you and we ask again for your forgiveness 
And by your spirit, you'll enable us to live for you and please you in every way for the glory of Jesus Christ. We thank you for these reminders that we were sharing today of all Jesus did for us, dying on the cross, pouring out his blood, being separated from you, taking the punishment for our sin on himself, all so that we might have the opportunity to be in a relationship with you through him. What an amazing gift. What a precious gift. And we give you thanks for Jesus. Amen. As we know, the bread and the wine that we share in today, they're simple elements, they're symbols. Um, They hold no power in themselves, but they do represent what Jesus has done in breaking his body for us on the cross, in shedding his blood. When Jesus shared the Passover with his disciples, he expressed his anticipation for that meal. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And he took the bread. He gave thanks, he broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We are going to be served the bread. Please take it and eat it and reflect on what that gift of life Jesus has given you means to you and give thanks for it. I'll ask the stewards to come forward, please. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Jesus said, Take this cup. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. 
You'll now be served the cup, but if you please hold it until everyone is served, then we'll drink together as one. one people committed to Jesus Christ, giving thanks for the gift of his life for us. Let's drink together. I'm going to invite you now to just stand, and we're just going to have a moment of silent prayer, silent reflection. Please hold your glass, and you'll keep the glass until the final song, and that will, the glass will be collected in the final song at the end of the service. So let's stand. Let's just spend some time quietly reflecting on what we've just experienced together. And then our band will lead us at an appropriate time as we'll sing the next song.
Please be seated. Let's pray together. Father, what a wonderful reminder of the gift of Jesus. Thank you that we can be here together to encourage each other in our walk. as we seek to be effective disciples of Jesus. And now as we look at a passage of scripture which is so familiar, open our eyes and our hearts to receive new truths and challenges as we reflect about what happened that first Good Friday morning and what that means for us now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a TV show on called Survivor. Some of you may have seen Survivor. There's about 46 different shows of called Survivor. And what that show is, it puts a large number of individuals from all walks of life on an island. And they are required to outwit, outplay, and outlast everyone else to win a prize, usually a million dollars or something like that. One thing about this show is very clear. To win, you have to lie and cheat and betray. There's no room for nice players in that context. But going into that show, there is an expectation betrayal will take place. And while it's a game, it does at times become very personal and people are hurt as a result. But what if betrayal is unexpected when a friend or family member or colleague betrays you? I don't mean a little argument or a crossword, but a deep betrayal that perhaps you did not see coming. As a pastor, I've supported people who've been been betrayed by partners, their children, fellow church members, work colleagues, extended family members. I've been betrayed by people personally and professionally. I recall in one church, I had to confront a rather challenging situation. I had the support of the church leaders and church members who said, we will stand up for you. But when the situation was addressed, there was silence and I was hung out to dry. Betrayal hurts. And it can be very hard to get over. And while we might move on, Reach of trust and the hurt experience penetrates deep within us. And when we think of betrayal on this Good Friday, there is none greater than one of the disciples of Jesus. Judas, possibly seen as the most infamous traitor of all, pursued a deliberate, planned and premeditated act of betrayal against the one he seemed to love all for some silver coins, a choice to make. We don't have many details about Judas as a disciple, but we do know he was called to be one. We just don't know why. At first glance, Judas didn't look at all like the traitor type. Some of the other disciples were known for some weakness prior to following Jesus. Simon Peter was famous for his impulsiveness. James and John were referred to as the sons of thunder. But there is nothing uncomplimentary mentioned about the character of Judas. In fact, he must have appeared quite trustworthy because he was given the responsibility of the treasurer of the disciples. Clarence McCartney writes, Judas was called to follow Christ called to be an apostle, called to be one of those who were to lay the foundation of the church. Disciples shared everything with Jesus, as we've discovered in our series throughout this year on Matthew. Food, accommodation, travel, washing, so much more. And when you're involved so closely with people for a period of time, deep friendships develop. Judas would have listened 
to the daily teaching of Jesus and his prayers. He would have seen him work his miracles. He was with the disciples preaching in Jesus' name. He let Jesus wash his feet at the Last Supper. He must have developed a close relationship with Jesus. But at some time, the friendship and the relationship changed. The words of Jesus were quite plain. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. Jesus constantly pointed to the kingdom that was to come, the kingdom of heaven where those who loved him would live forever with God. So how could a likeable, respectful man like this with such a a good beginning in life spend three years in the company of Jesus and then do what he did? Perhaps Judas found it all a little frustrating. He could see what had been done, what, what had to be done, but it didn't happen. Perhaps he was disillusioned with Jesus and his persistent refusal to take control of the land. Perhaps Judas was embarrassed by the time he invested in Jesus with no obvious results. That's all our supposition. But for whatever reason, Judas could take no more. Financial gain became the motivator and he went to the priests in chapter in 26, chapter 26. Then one of the 12, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, what are you willing to give me to deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. This decision was determined and considered and his response after committing to the betrayal of Jesus was to watch and wait for the right time to turn on his friend. Even when confronted by his own behaviour at the Last Supper, when Jesus himself addressed what he was about to do, there was no change, only further betrayal with a false denial. Again, in chapter 26, it says, And while they were eating, Jesus said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to one after the other, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Jesus answered, You have said so. Judas, having been confronted with the words of Jesus, took the bread from Jesus. And at that moment, John's account of this incident tells us his plan was consolidated, not changed. He had the opportunity to turn away from his plan, but instead the process of betrayal continued. The love and lure of money was too strong. His betrayal would go to the end. 30 pieces of silver was what it took for Judas to turn away from the Son of God and set in motion the events which would ultimately lead to the death of the Son of God. A choice to make, a decision to implement. We all make choices in life, some good, some not so good. A decision to smoke on a school excursion is not a great one to make. A decision to do anything but study during your HSC year is not a great one to make. A decision to drive fast on a wet road coming to a sharp corner is, again, not a wise decision. Now, not that any of those have happened in my life, but if I did make those sort of choices, sorry, Mum, I've had to live with the consequences of them. While Judas was chosen and made a choice to be part of the discipleship team of Jesus, he also made a choice how effective being a disciple would be in his life. Originally it was understood that Judas was from Judea and so it seemed he was the only Judean in the first group of disciples. He wasn't part of that inner circle like Peter and James and John. So perhaps 
he always felt he wasn't part of the in-group. And being left out sometimes leads us to misguided actions to make people notice us. Maybe we become people who smoke down the back of the school just to be accepted. Maybe we make smart aleck comments to teachers just to look cool. Or maybe we get in a fight with someone just to prove how tough we are. Again, not that those have ever happened to me, but the point remains. Trying to fit in, trying to be accepted and being unable to may cause us to make poor and unwise decisions. Judas himself had a sense of morality at times. And John records his reaction when Jesus was anointed at Bethany by Mary using expensive perfume to wash his feet. It says in John 12, But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. What a noble statement. Social justice was his heart. Who could fault Judas' response here? Isn't that what we are called to do as disciples, to show justice and mercy, to care for those who are marginalised? and in But as noble as this direct declaration was, it was fueled by a heart not to serve others, but one that was selfish and self-focused. John again goes on, he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. The waste of perfume was possibly another catalyst for Judas to think of an alternative plan. I mean, people wanted and expected Jesus to lead a rebellion against the Romans, to set up a special kingdom on earth. This Messiah had been promised and now had come. Surely this means some action to deliver Israel from Roman rule and become the head of all nations of the earth. But Jesus speaks about the cross. He offends the leaders of the Jews and the Pharisees are rising up against Jesus. Jesus is not doing as Judas wants or expects, and this is not what's supposed to happen. And his allegiance gradually deteriorates, and he starts to disengage himself from the movement which promised so much and now faces complete defeat. He had the choice to become a true follower of Jesus, a great apostle like the other disciples, but he chose a plan of action which resulted in his ultimate demise. Even at this point, a different decision could have been made, but Judas continued down the path he planned, makes his choice, and he lives with the consequences of his betrayal. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. I have sinned, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What's that to us? That's your responsibility. Judas knew his actions led to being Jesus being condemned. And his guilt overtook him. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. Kevin Hudson writes, The biggest mistake you can make is not the sin. No, the biggest mistake you can make is your failure to ask God for forgiveness. A choice to make, a decision to implement, a result to accept. Judas knew Jesus. He walked with him. He talked with him, along with all the other disciples. He'd been with Jesus when he gave sight to the blind. He saw so many other healings and miracles. Judas had been with Jesus to help distribute a meal to over 5,000 people and saw how all were fed with baskets of food to spare. 
Judas knew Jesus walked on water and the waves stopped when Jesus spoke to them. Judas witnessed the welcome parade as Jesus came into Jerusalem. The clouds declaring, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Judas experienced the love of Jesus as he shared with him at the Last Supper and was personally challenged by the words of Jesus to him. But none of this was enough to stop his actions. None of this was enough to turn him away from his plan of betrayal. Two people died that day. One chose to take his own life. The other had his life taken. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, He gave up his spirit. On that day, one poor person saw no hope and took his life. On that day, another gave hope, choosing to have his life taken, absorbing our sin on himself and giving us all the opportunity to receive God's forgiveness and to be his disciple. As we reflect on the betrayal of Jesus, as we contemplate the death of Jesus, where do we fit in the story? Are we like Judas, have seen all that Jesus provides, experienced his love and compassion, and yet unable to commit ourselves fully to him? Judas looked like a disciple. He acted like a disciple. He spoke like a disciple. But in the end, he wasn't a disciple. Do we look like a disciple? Do we act like a disciple? Do we speak like a disciple? But right now, we actually can't claim to be a disciple. Good Friday is not the end. It's the beginning. For we look forward to Sunday when we hear again the wonderful news of the resurrection of Jesus. And there's a challenge for us to make a choice, to make a decision for Jesus, to accept his sacrifice for us, to receive the forgiveness he offers and be strengthened by the hope we can have in him. The invitation has been given. The sacrifice has been made. The price has been paid. But the choice is up to us. So what will our choice be today and over this Easter weekend? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you once again for the wonderful good news of Jesus' death and resurrection. Father, we think of the story of Judas and so many of us can put ourselves in that story. Forgive us for the times in which we have betrayed you. And from today, we commit ourselves to serve you, to honour you, to live for you as we receive that gift of forgiveness that comes through Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. Would you please stand as we sing our final song and during this song, your communion glass will be collected. This song is called, This Is Our God, and some of you may not know this song, but um, may you let the words, the lyrics minister to each and every one of you, and if you know this song, do sing this song with us, you know, it's a song that talks about reflection, that's what Pastor Howard has just uh, shared in his wonderful message about what God has done for each and every one of us. So just join us and um, we'll sing this song together. Amen.
stripes we are healed by his wounds we are made whole 
We leave today with the assurance of the forgiveness made possible through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We go in the name of Jesus and live in the salvation made possible by the goodness of this Friday. And we go with a hope and anticipation of the ultimate victory we will celebrate afresh on Easter Sunday when we gather again. For it's in the name of the risen Jesus we pray. Amen.